Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello friends, welcome back to this uh, lecture on uh, problem solving. Now this lecture is a continuation from the previous lecture uh, which we in which we saw what is problem solving, what is the nature of problem solving and what does a problem comprise of. And after that looking at what a problem comprises of, we also looked at uh, whether uh, different kinds of problem do exist and we looked at uh, Mayer's definition of a number of type of problems which could actually exist. So, we looked at five different kind of problems and we saw how each other in what respects. Then we looked at uh, some problems. So, we looked at of problems. The first approach that we looked at uh, was uh, the approach uh, that behaviorists took in terms of uh, Skinner's idea of or uh, Thorndike's idea of law of readiness and how does a problem solve in terms of uh, associations which are made between correct responses and uh, the consequences of it. So, that was one approach to solving problem in terms of the behaviorist in terms of the behavioral psychology. And the next approach that we saw in last class uh, which helped us understand how to solve problem was in terms of the gestalt approach, uh, which talked about problem solution as reorganization of uh, the items or materials available in a problem or so uh, what this approach said is that problem solution is about reorganizing uh, the problem elements in such a way that a novel solution comes up. And so, it, they talk about something called the I experience or the insight. And so, this is what uh, in brief we saw in the last class. And in addition to this, we also saw the cognitive approach to solution of a problem and uh, there we discussed the idea of Nival and Simons uh, based on Nival and Simons idea of uh, what information processing theory is, the idea of a GPS, uh, the general problem solver. And so, this GPS basically then talks about how to break the problem into its sub problems and then arriving at the uh, larger solution of the problem in terms of integrating uh, smaller problems or finding solutions to uh, smaller problems uh, of the larger problem. Now, what do I mean by this? Take a large problem, break up into smaller problems, then arrive at solutions for smaller problems, integrate them together and then arrive at a final solution of the larger problem and that is what the idea of the general problem solver was and the concept of a general problem solver. Now, what are we going to do in today's class? Now, in today's lecture, we will see uh, what is a solution to a problem, how does solution to a problem arises and not only that, we will also see what are the problems in solving a problem, what are the uh, hindrances which are out there in solving a problem. So, when problem sol uh, solution occurs or when we try to solve a problem, what are the kind of uh, obstacles that we face and how to go about these obstacles, how to take uh, care of these obstacles. In addition, we will also see the several factors which go ahead and help us or basically better or increase or decrease problem solution. So, let us start today's lecture by something called representation of a problem. So, solving a problem by using any of the ways either it is a gestaltist approach or using a behavioral way requires the first step of it requires to encode a problem. Now, as I said problem uh, formulation itself or the idea of a problem itself is to understand some kind of uh, hindrance, some kind of a uneasy state and representing this uneasy state as a mental representation is what problem is all about. So, basically 
the first step in problem solution is encoding the problem or basically making a mental representation of the problem that one is facing. And so, several problems or several hindrances uh, or obstacles can arise at this very first phase, where somebody uh, might not be able to represent a problem or form a, uh, a good representation, a mental representation of a problem. Now, remember in long term memory, one of the problems uh, that we faced or one of the things that we looked into is something called uh, forgetting. And one of the rules of forgetting or one of the theories of forgetting was uh, in terms of the fact that the problem or the information which was uh, thought to be encoded in the long term memory was never encoded. And that was basically due to poor encoding or due to non encoding of the problem forgetting happens. A similar situation arises here, one of the problems or one of the obstacles in problem solving could be at the very first stage of problem solution, which is encoding or forming of mental representation and that is called problem representation. So, let us go ahead and look at what is problem representation. Now, problem solving it involves the process of converting a uh, presented information uh, into some type of internal uh, mental representation. So, as I said the first step in a problem solution is to take up a problem or to take up the elements of a problem and then to do an actual encoding of it in terms of mental representation that is the first step. So, no matter what problem you face whether it is writing a paper or uh, going somewhere or eating something no matter what the problem is first you need to understand this problem first you need to understand uh, the related items in this problem or how, what is the problem the question that the problem is posing to you and then to go ahead and do a exact representation or do some kind of mental representation of this into the mind. Now, within the uh, framework of the GPS problem solver, uh, re problem representation involves correctly specifying the problem space that we correctly identifying uh, the initial state as well as the uh, goal state and the operators which must be applied and within the constraints of the problem. So, basically then problem representation in terms of the GPS solver, in terms of the GPS sequencing is about finding out the problem space, defining the problem space or laying out the boundary conditions of the problem space. So, what we get to do here is that if this is the idea of my problem space, problem representation basically involves defining the boundaries of this problem. So, this is my GPS solver this space and not only defining the boundaries of this space, but it also leads us to uh, understanding uh, or uh, identifying what is the initial state, where is my problem starting and where is my sub goal. So, these are the several sub goals which are there. This is my uh, initial state or IS I would write and this is my goal state GS I write. So, basically identifying this I s, what are the parameters of this I s and what are the parameters or attributes of this goal state. So, what will the problem look like at the initial state and what will the problem look like at the goal state. Also in addition to it, uh, problem representation also involves finding out the constraints, what are the constraints. So, given the fact that this is the boundary condition and these are the attributes of the initial and the final state, this, uh, there will be several constraints in solving this problem. So, what are the several constraints? Now, one constraint could be how we can divide the problem into smaller parts. So, what are the constraints or what are the rules into it? And further to that, it may also define about the different operators, so different solutions. For example, this goal state or this sub goal may be solved by using behavioral approaches, but this goal state may be solved by using the gestalt approach right or this goal state could be solved by using another kind of approach which is that. And so, each state or each sub goal here may be solved by using different approaches, but then what I am getting at final is this is the initial state of the sub goal and this is the final state of the sub goal. So, here I get the solution and then I take from this solution I uh, this solution now becomes my uh, secondary uh, initial state and then I move on. So, this is what it basically involves. So, in, in general what the problem representation really means is to find out the initial state of the problem space, find out the goal state of what the problem will look like, identifying the constraints, the hindrances which is out there, uh, which are there uh, ready to block you for solving a problem and 
also in addition to that the, the type of operators, the type of solution mechanisms, the type of solution on analysis that you will use to solve the problem. So, basically this is what is problem representation. For example, look at this problem. Now, I will give you one minute to look at this problem and come up with a solution. Let me see if you can come up with a solution to this. So, starting now I will wait for one minute. So, coming back to the problem, I hope that you are able to solve this problem. Most of you would have been able to solve this problem. So, basically it is it's the problem talks about two monks going up and down uh, or one monk, uh, monk going up a particular hill starting at sunrise and reaching there at sunset and then starting at sunset and reaching towards the downhill position from where he starts at the sunset. So, basically what the problem ask is to find out to verify whether there is a point which the monk is going to uh, cross both while ascending the mountain and descending the mountain. Now, you realize what, what is the solution to this, do you understand what is the solution to this. And so, most, most people who start uh, writing mathematical equations to solve this problem, you will not be able to solve this problem by this and this is what I mean by problem representation, which is basically understanding what a problem is. And I am presenting you the solution. The easiest possible way to solve this problem is using a visualization. And so, what I am going to do is show you a visualization of the Monk problem. And so, if you do the visualization like this again coming back to the solution. So, if this is the problem, the solution is doing a visualization. And as you see, if I do a visualization, these two people go up and down the mountain and so there is a spot where they are going to meet. And so, the easiest way to look at this problem is doing the visual uh, visualization or visual interpretations of it. And so, if you use any other interpretation or any other operator to solve this problem, you may not arrive uh, very easily at the solution of this problem. Right. So, this is basically what is problem representation to identify what the problem is and to understand the sequence to understand how it should be solved. Now, I will give you another problem, try to solve this problem. Now, I will give you 30 seconds, it is a very easy problem, I will give you 30 seconds to solve the problem and let us see if you can solve this problem. Right. So, here goes the time and so I'm uh, more than 30 seconds over. So, basically then did you solve the problem and most of you would have been able to. Now, what we realize here is that in this particular problem what we need is we need a mathematical representation. So, in comparison to the visual representation that we used in the last problem the kind of representation, the kind of solution, the kind of operator that we are going to use in this particular uh, solution or this particular problem is the mathematical operator. And so, in this way the problem gets solved easily. So, if you do a visual representation of this you are not able to solve a problem. And so, this is what problem representation talks about. It talks about that at the very initial phase we have to understand how to solve the problem or represent the problem in the correct format. Now, uh, rigidity in representation. Now, problem 
solutions to problem or hindrances to problem or solution may arise because people get rigid about solving a representation or people become rigid in representing a problem. So, the initial representation of problem is basically it is critical and failure to represent these kind of representations may lead to number of uh, factors. Now, one of the fir first factor is that uh, sufficient attention has not been given to the problem. So, when a problem is presented to you and if you do not pay sufficient attention to parts of the problem or to the problem as a whole, what would happen is that you will not be able to identify the key elements of the problem and this will lead to you identifying the problem itself and representing it in the correct form. And once a problem is represented in the incorrect form, a solution will not be most probably the solution will not be arrived at. Now, the second problem or the second hindrance is that problem uh, elements have not been understood. What would have happened in this case is that even if you put some attention to it or more attention to a problem, you did not understand the various uh, elements of the problem or what is it asking you. So, basically it is like looking at a question and not understanding what the question is asking you. And so, uh, some people make questions like that, which which has a lot of so uh, basically in in most open ended questions or open textbook questions, you get the question in such a way that the question revolves around certain things, but there are certain key elements that you need to realize. And once you realize these key elements, you will be able to solve a problem. And so another problem element or another factor which helps in problem solving or which hinders problem solving is not understanding or not realizing the various elements of the problem and what relation they have to each other. The third problem uh, that could arise or third obstacle that could arise is previous experience of similar problem uh, may not have led to encoding the problem elements in a uh, rigid manner. So, what would have happened is since some examples of the uh, present problem and this is basically called analogous problem solving. So, when solving a problem due to past experiences, what we tend to do is not look at a problem in a particular way, but think of the problem in some fixed manner and that is basically a reason for failures in problem solving. So, instead of thinking independently thinking about a problem, independently realizing a problem or independently focusing uh, your attention onto certain elements of the problem. We tend to use a heuristic approach to it, match the problem to some already stored format of how it was solved previously and that could lead to problem uh, not being solved or leading to incorrect representation of the problem. Now, some of the major hindrances to problem solving arises from something called mental set. So, what is it? It is the tendency to rely on habits and procedures used in the past and this is what is mental set. So, basically if I know or basically if I think of solving a problem in a particular way, I tend to basically uh, use that format and take a new problem and uh, fit it into that format. And if I do that, what happens is the solution becomes difficult. So, this, this basically idea, this basic idea of using a mental set or using a previous habit of solving a problem in a particular way leads you to uh, leads you to incorrect representation of the problem and thereby leads to solution of the incorrect solutions of the problem. Now, look at a uh, question here and so this is the problem which I have. So, there are 6 eggs in a basket, 6 people take one of these each eggs. Now, how is it that one egg is still left in the basket? Now, most of you would worry about the fact that how this has happened, but then hidden within this is the representation problem and mental set says that 6 people took 6 different eggs. So, how is it that one, uh, the one egg is still in the basket? The solution to this uh, you have to realize that uh, the last person who took the egg also took the basket with him and then it is possible that the last egg is still in the basket. And but when, when you to think of this in terms of 6 different people, the mathematical uh, variable, then you think 6 people going away taking 6 different eggs and do not realize that the 6 person can also take a basket with it. And so, there is where the mental set is all about. So, the mental set they tends to affect the representation phase of a problem uh, solving as past experiences leads to inappropriate representation of a problem. So, what mental sets tends to do is that as I said there are certain past mental representations and these mental representations or these inappropriate ways of representing a problem actually uh, makes you uh, think of a problem uh, a solution in a particular fixed way and that leads to incorrect representation of the problem and incorrect solution to that particular problem. Another factor 
which is of importance or which is of any importance to solutions of problems or uh, in terms of representation and solutions of problem is something called functional fixedness. What does it please, uh, what does it mean? It refers to people's tendency to view objects in a narrow fixed sense right in terms of the typical functions of an object. So, in functional fixedness what we tend to do is that we just look at something in a particular way in a particular manner. So, a spoon for example, should be looked at or is looked at only as a spoon something which is for eating. We do not think of a spoon as a lever and so, what we can do is we can use you can think of a spoon as a lever and then use it to raise the, uh, the upper part of a tin. Uh, or if you have a tin can and there is a lid to the tin can, we can uh, wedge the spoon between the tin can and the lid and apply pressure to it basic uh, physics, basic simple physics and that can help us in uh, opening the lid of a tin, but then we do not realize it and functional fixedness says that a spoon is thought of as a spoon and so it should not be doing anything else or uh, using the down part of a toothpaste, the bottom of a toothpaste as a tongue cleaner, now the tooth, uh, tooth I am sorry toothbrush and so the toothbrush is thought of as a toothbrush and so we do not think of it as a tongue cleaner and so, but there are certain toothbrushes are available and so functional fixedness what it says is that certain objects are seen as that object are having a fixed function and it cannot be seen as having another function or more functions out of it. So, one development perspective says that functional uh, fixedness they uh, peak up or they start or they hold on to people as they grow older in age. So, younger children are more flexible in terms of functional fixedness they can they are not uh, harmed by or they are not uh, troubled by functional fixedness, but people as they grow in age they become this narrow sense they approach at this narrow sense of how a functional or what a functional fixedness, fixedness is. Now, look at this particular problem this is called the two string problem. Now, I will give you 30 seconds to look at this problem and tell me how to solve this and I can bet you that due to functional fixedness you will not be able to answer this question. And so, once you are able to see this problem, I am pretty sure that you are not able to solve this problem. The reason here is that functional fixedness, the certain items which have been mentioned, the chair, the plier and all those have been represented or is represented in your memory in a fixed way and so you are not able to solve this problem. But a solution is there of this problem and this is the simple solution. What Kurt has to do is to climb up into the chair, hold one end of the string, on to the other end of the string he has to uh, tie the pillar, make a swing out of it, uh, go and stand on this chair and then uh, uh, basically uh, hold on to this string. Now, if, if you put a pillar here, it will come back to you and then you are holding on to this and so you can go ahead and then tie it together that is what is. So, he has to recognize that he can use the pillar as a novel function as a weight for the pendulum as I said this is the swing that it will do. So, tie the pillar here it will work function as a pendulum and you can always go ahead and solve the problem. And so, what, what people do not understand is the pillar is used the plier here is used for mechanical things for uh, basically use uh, tightening of screws and all. And so, you do not realize that the plier can also be used as an object for swinging or for making a pendulum and that way you can tie up that and so this solution problem to solution arises from the fact that you are not able you are functionally fixated by certain functions of these objects. Now, another uh, interesting thing basic problem which can arise uh, with solutions of problem is something called stereotyping. So, stereotyping threat occurs when a member of a negatively stereotyped group feels that the stereotype might be used as to judge their behavior thus resulting in a negative judgment. So, here in this kind of a problem solution or present problem representation what would happen is that since a certain groups have been stereotyped in certain way they are not able to register the problem or represent the problem in a correct way. And so, problem uh, the problem if not represented in a correct way a solution could not be generated. And so, Quinn and Spencer 2001 uh, they use men and women uh, 
to solve math problem uh, uh, by using either a word uh, uh, word representation of it or a numerical representation of it and this is what they form. So, this is the kind of problem that is out there and so this problem repro uh, represents a, a statement or basically it is a word problem. And so, this kind of problem was given to people. Now, uh, since this is a word problem, it can this problem can also be represented in this particular format. So, either I represent the format uh, the problem in this format, which is now a word problem, or I could use a algebraic problem or an equation problem or e equational format of it. So, two representations are there, and so it was believed that or there was a um, uh, need or there were this study basically proposed that women would solve more of numerical problem than uh, in, in word. So, word uh, the same problem in terms of a word when it is uh, related in terms of word form than when it is related in terms of an equation and this is the results from Queen and Spencer study. It was found that the males and females. So, word problem more males were less males were able to solve the word problem and more males were able to solve the numeric format. So, this is the numeric format of so the problem and this is the word format. And in terms of the fact that now it was proposed that more women would be solving the word problem, more women would be attempting the uh, word problem and solving it much uh, easily, but the solution represents that only 8 women out of the total number of people which has been uh, given this solution only 8 preferred the word format for it. Most women format the or uh, they use the numerical format or they applied the numerical format and through the numerical format they were uh, much easier for them to arrive at a solution. And so, this is basically gender, gender stereotyping or basically stereotyping. So, basically due to stereotyping initially it was believed that women would be uh, more comfortable in solving the word representation of the same problem, but then this is not what the solution is. And so, this is another reason for uh, 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 representation problem representations or obstacles in problem representation. Now, solutions to problem. Now, once the problems has been successfully transformed from an uh, externally presented information into an internally presented information, the next phase of problem solving involves uh, searching for and testing evaluating of solutions. So, once a problem has been encoded in the right format, a right representation of it has to be done. Now, a problem solving process has to be evaluated or it has to be searched of how to solve this problem. Now, within the context of Newman and Simons 1972 IP approach information processing approach, problem solution amounts to traveling through the problem space. So, basically in terms of problem representation it is identifying the initial state. What is the initial state of a problem? So, in a GPS solver in a GPS prob, uh, problem solving space the problem representation is basically at this point where we need to identify what is the initial state of the problem or how it the problem should be represented as the initial state. Whereas, the solution to a problem requires us to move through this state from the initial to the goal state and realizing how to move from the initial state to the goal state. Now, there are several ways of how to solve a problem and the first interesting way or first important way of how problems can be solved is using the algorithmic approach or using algorithms. So, what are algorithms then? Now, algorithms are a set of rules that can be applied systematically to solve certain type of problems. So, these are a set of rules, these are a certain uh, uh, list of rules which when applied in the correct format, which when are, uh, applied in the correct sequence or which applied which when applied sequentially will finally, always give you the solution. So, that is the best part of an algorithm. An algorithm is a set of steps, set of steps bounded by rules. Now, once you use the set of steps and once you pass through all the set of these steps which have been there, then you will finally, arrive at a solution and that is guaranteed. So, almost algorithms always guarantee a solution to it right. Now, mathematical formula is a good example of an algorithm. So, you have to go through the number of steps which is there of problem solution you cannot jump and if you go through a number of steps you are always going to solve the uh, problem. And remember fr uh, from earlier classes of how an algorithm is written I am probably sure that most of you had mathematics till plus 12 and so if, if, if that is what it is then you do know what an algorithm is. So, basically then uh, how to define an algorithm for uh, making t the idea is that you have 
have to describe the step to step process from right from taking water into a pan, going to heat it, adding something into it and in a step by step manner you will always end up by making a tea. So, algorithm is a set of sequences or a sequence of steps which when followed in the correct order it always guaranteed a solution. And so, one way of uh, finding solution to problem is using the uh, algorithm. And so, the two uh, for example, look at this problem two short sides of a triangle are 3 centimeter and 4 centimeter. And so, what is the hypotenuse? It has to be 5. So, a square plus b square is c square that is how we look into it. And so, in this way it has to be 5 centimeter and so, this is an algorithm that is a correct way of doing it. And so, we know that this is how it has to be solved. So, algorithms are very powerful problem solving techniques applied correctly an algorithm is always giving you the correct solution if there is an existing. Look at this initial problem that we encountered. Now, if we need an algorithm to solve this problem, there will be several obstacles or there will be several states or there will be several steps into it. For example, what would happen is it will lead to since it is uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, it is 6. So, it will lead to basically 6 factorial uh, uh, number of representations which is there. Now, how, what do I mean by this? What will happen is that initially I will just change the last two letters. So, this the next letter is n i then I will change the third letter and so one letter at a time I can keep on changing and then arrive at a problem. This is basically using the algorithmic approach. So, in algorithmic approach all representations or all changes within this letter all arrangements uh, different arrangements will will be there and from that this final solution will be uh, outputted. Now, if you do that you will have to do these many number of representations or these many number of uh, variations into it to finally, arrive, arrive at the answer that this will lead to Viking as the answer. Now, there are several shortcomings to using the algorithm as I said now if it requires these many steps if it requires these many variations which are out there if it requires us to do these many variations for arriving at a solution then it is a it is a huge task. Now, when it is a huge task so basically then there are some shortcomings to it and so what are the shortcomings first the exhaustive nature make them overly tedious and quite impractical. What would happen is since 6 factorial times doing it uh, these many times doing all representations all uh, for all number of uh, uh, variations on, on this. So, each letter being varied in, in uh, not only in relation to itself, but in relation to all other letters will be huge and it will be too exhaustive. And so, it will require basically uh, a computer for you to do this. And so, the if, but, but if you do this the correct answer is one of these sequences. And so, one of the problems or one of the hindrances or one of the shortcomings of using the algorithmic approach is that it it is very tedious in nature. It requires a number of uh, uh, variations and so it is quite impractical. Nobody has that much time to go up and look at these many variations. Now, simple code breaking, password breaking. How do you do it? One of the ways of doing a, a password hacking is basically using or, or uh, to basically do ethical hacking is to use something called the brute force. Now, in the brute force what happens is all combinations that exist into the dictionary is used by the computer to arrive at the password. Now, if we do that and if it is uh, assuming that it is a 7 letter password then we will have to do almost innumerable uh, number of representations right from a in the first place to a uh, 26 different representations of the first place 26 different representations of the seventh place second place till the seventh place and then in relation to each other also using each representation so huge numbers and so this is one problem or this is one uh, shortcoming of the algorithmic approach what is the second shortcoming there simply aren't any for most of the problems in our daily life. So, what would happen is since algorithms are the best way to come up with a solution and they always guarantee a final solution. What it turns out to be is that for most problems of our daily life we do not have an algorithm out there. And so, we, if we do not have an algorithm out there then solutions are difficult and then it becomes difficult for us to come up with a solution because there is no algorithm there is no true method of doing it. Why? Because each new problem daily life problem is a new one it is not an exact replica of some problem that we have seen and so that is one thing. Another interesting way of coming up with solutions to problem is using a heurist. Now, what is a heurist? These are general strategies or rules of thumb that can be applied to various problems. So, basically then one way is using the algorithm another way of solving a problem is using a shortcut. 
and this shortcut or mental shortcut or rule of thumb is called a heurist. So, these serves as a shortcuts through problem space. What heurists are? It are these are fixed ways of solving a problem or these are fixed ways of how do we go ahead and bypass the algorithm, algorithm some steps of the algorithm. So, these are what are heurists. So, given the strength and limitation of human problem solver along with the fact that most problems are ill defined, they are relatively large problem spaces, heuristic problem solving is more effective. The reason is since the problem space is huge, since uh, any problem requires a number uh, big problem space and a number of sub problems into it. What people tend to do while solving problem is using a heurist. What does a heurist do? It uh, gives you some kind of a shortcut. So, what is this shortcut? It is in terms of bypassing certain steps of the algorithm. Now, since we know that if we come to know that step 2, 3, 4 or 5 of an algorithm always gives a particular answer. For example, mixing uh, uh, yellow with green gives a particular kind of color and if we know that we need not repeat this each time or uh, mixing Tea, tea leaves into uh, boiling water and uh, boiling water always gives a certain kind of color, a certain kind of taste and flavor. We need not repeat this again and again and so we can jump by stating that if you mix tea into it, this is the kind of color that we are going to get. And so, this is basically what is called uh, the heuristic approach of problem solving. For example, how do we solve the same problem? So, in terms of algorithm we saw that we will do n number of manipulations, we will do these uh, six uh, different letters are there and we can manipulate, we can do all number of arrangements out, out of it and then come up with a problem. A good heurist of how to solve this problem is that thinking of G k, V k and I k n are not possible. So, English words do not start with this kind of beginning and so we can eliminate these kind of or these different startings with it and so these are eliminated and we can say, since use more, uh, more heurist and then come up with the final answer that V i k i n g is the final solution because this is the heurist. It says that if in your understanding or in your, in your uh, life you have not seen in your readings you have not seen any words starting with g k v k v g or i k n and so uh, these can be eliminated this can be ruled out. Also look at this particular things. Now, it is a daily shopping experience and if you do that basically or if you think that you are shopping what most people tend to do is something called round up. And so, one easy way to solve this problem is rounding this to 20 and rounding this to 30 dollars and rounding this to 30 dollars. So, 30, 30, 60, 70, 80 is the answer. So, 80 dollar is what you are spending. But algorithmic approach says is that we have to add up 9.95, 0 0.98, 0 0.97. Generally speaking, most people will say that I spent up 80 dollars. So, uh, if you are purchasing 3 items, it is 80 dollars which is there. What I have done is I have rounded up and this rounding up is called the heurist or this is the problem or this is the mental shortcut. So, the fastest way uh, is to basically go ahead and round up and this is what is called the uh, heuristic way of solving a problem. A third way of solving a problem is by using a means ends analysis. Now, what is a means end analysis? Now, basically the general problem solver which was done by Newman and Simon, it basically utilizes a heurist known, known as something called means ends analysis. Now, what is the uh, MEA? It involves basically breaking a problem. So, if I, I, this is my problem state, initial state and this is my goal state and what then happens is that means ends analysis says that I take this problem and break into four different parts and each of it which is solvable. And then what I do is I then this becomes this part then becomes my initial state 1 and this is my goal state 1. So, I first think of solving this part of it. And then when this goal state now becomes my initial state to problem 2, I solve this part of it, then I solve this part of it and then I solve this part of it. For example, think about launching a rocket. If I want to launch a rocket, this is a huge problem. Now, I can then divide this rocket launching into several steps. For example, thinking about uh, the physics of it, thinking about uh, what material should be used, what kind of fuel should be used. So, there would be people who will calculating the fuel, calculating how the rocket moves up, calculating things like what, what is the material that should be used. And so, several people or this 
launching a rocket can be broken down into several tests right from the physics to the chemistry of it, the physics of it and several other uh, systems in which should be integrated through, through the electrical appliances and so on and so forth. Now, I saw, saw, solve this one part one part by one part and then I come with the final solution or a simple thing that if you have a car it is not starting. Now, if the car is not starting break this uh, starting of the car into several sub parts. For example, check the key, check some the ignition, check the battery and so on and so forth. So, several solutions are there and I arrive from one, one solution state to the other solution state. So, first step is to raising up the uh, bonnet to identifying where the battery is to testing the battery to basically then testing some other facts the electrical circuits testing the fuse and then finally, arrive at solution of this problem how to start a car if which is not starting. So, then the MEA it involves breaking up the problem into several sub goals in which accomplishing each sub goal moves the solver close to the final goal of the problem solution. As I said if you attain the if you solve this huge problem if you break this huge problem into smaller problems and solve it one by one or solve parts of it one by one you will finally, arrive at the solution. As the term, uh, term implies in MEA the solver systematically attempts to devise means to get to the each sub goals end. MEA can be effective way of transforming a uh, effective way for solving a transformational problem. Now, look at this problem and if I want to solve this remember this is the solution to it. Right. So, from state 1 where it was here to state 2 where it was here there is a solution to it and you can see the solution. So, on the on the uh, right hand side I have the solution. So, this is how the solution really looks like from moving from this state to this state this is the number of solutions and so it realizes or you have to realize that the problem has to be broken down into sub parts. There are certain constraints and so if you break the problem into sub parts you will be able to solve this problem as it is. Now, when you actually uh, another way of solving a problem is using analogous problem right. And so, what we do in analogous problem is that we think of a problem when when uh, reaching at the solution of a problem we think of a problem which is similar to the problem which is at hand. And then we tend to borrow certain features or we tend to look at the similarities with the problem which, which is at hand and then think of the uh, problem uh, which uh, which we are thinking about which is represented in our mind and then solve it. For example, I am giving you a problem. Now, the problem and I will give you a solution to it. So, the problem is that uh, uh, there is the person and he has to be treated with lasers. Now, the fact is that uh, if uh, this person is given a high voltage uh, uh, laser treatment what would happen is or a high energy laser treatment what would happen is the uh, a single focus uh, I mean a uh, single ray of laser light is given to you with high energy what will happen is the organ which is diseased in, in, the, in this case that will disintegrate or it will burn up. And so, what is the solution or what is the solution to this problem how should we treat, but then this organ can take in uh, small or it can only take in small laser energy values right. So, it cannot take in a high energy laser it can take in small energy laser. If you give if you give in a high energy laser from one direction what will happen is the um, uh, in, instead of curing the problem instead of curing the cell which is diseased the whole organ will burn up. So, what is the solution? The solution here is using several lasers which are low powered from several different directions. Now, what will happen is the, since the whole organ is now surrounded. So, it is basically in this case what has happened is if I give one laser with a high value high value laser this organ will burn up. So, what I do is I use several different lasers which are smaller in energy from several sides. So, then since it is each laser has a very low value it is not going to burn up the or organ it is only going to hit upon the particular cells which are diseased and also the fact that the total energy of all these lasers will be the energy which is required to burn up these cells. So, I can then distribute it across. 
now analogous problem is uh, there is a, a military officer who is going to go ahead and, uh, and, and capture a particular uh, fort. Now, the only problem is the fort is uh, bounded by certain bridges. Now, it, he requires certain amount of army and certain amount of tanks to be uh, taken before fighting the war, but the fact is that each bridge is going to or each bridge has a certain limited capacity of carrying the tank. Now, he has to take 10 tanks and but each bridge can only take one tank and a uh, few soldiers onto it. So, how do how does he go about solving this problem analogous to what we have uh, do. So, if he, if he can relate the, the uh, his problem the major or the commander of army can uh, relate his problem to the problem of uh, this this particular uh, laser thing what he could do is that he can use several bridges and each bridge will now hold one tank and then each of it will arrive at the enemy fort and can actually win the war. And so, this is how analogous problem or how analogous problem solving really works. Now, in analogous problem solving there are two things to look at one uh, in terms of comparison one is the something called the surface versus structural features. So, one of the primary steps in solving problems by using analogy involving the use of mapping the original problem to the new problem. Basically, what happens here is that in terms of what we saw that you have to understand the commander of the army has to understand that how his problem of, of winning the enemy fort is similar to the medical problem that I defined before. So, he has to go ahead and map these two problems together or basically make a one to one relation between his problem and the problem which, which, uh, which was uh, the medical problem. Now, Gick and, uh, and Holyak they term this mapping process as schema induction. He says that this mapping or this identification of one to one identification of the elements of the medical problem and the elements of this war problem how they are related together is basically called schema induction. Now, our ability to notice map and develop schemata depends on particular type of similarity. So, we look at similarities and the more similarity a particular section of the problem a particular part of the problem has to the new problem which is out there the more sim, uh, the more easier it is for us to solve. Now, these two can be of two types. So, we look at two types of similarities one is called the surface feature similarities. Now, in the surface feature similarities what happens is specific elements of the uh, problems are mac if two problems sh uh, they share specific surface features we believe that it is same and then we uh, go ahead and uh, basically map the problem together for example, paper jams. Now, if there is a printer and all of you are very familiar with what a printer is. So, if you have a printer at home and it it, uh, it gives up paper jams then uh, if I take you to a new printer or if I introduce you a new printer you will be more or less uh, similar you will understand that the back of the printer is where the roller is and so that is where the paper, paper jam is and so it will take you very less time because most printers work in the similar way. It uses the same kind of roller mechanism and so you will always look forward for where is the back. Uh, button or awning a printer. And so, you know that the, the central switch will be big and it will give you the affordance of pushing down. And so, uh, no matter what printer I am giving you with the idea that the most printers require this kind of uh, this kind of build up you understand that pushing this button is what is going to help and so, this is called surface similarity mapping. In structural features although the surface features although two problems may not look like each other, but then there are certain uh, unique features or the certain meaningful features within the problem itself which would uh, look identical and that will make solution of the problem easy. And so, in the case uh, that we described below the commander has to realize that although the other problem was a uh, medical problem, but the same kind of solution do exist. For example, in this case in understanding the structural features two problems are structurally similar they may look quite different on the surface and underlying similarities would be there. For example, look at the two sentences one is active wise the other is passive wise if you look into it the dog chased by the dog chased the cat or the cat was chased by the dog both of them although structurally they are different, but meaning wise in terms of the meaning in terms of the semantics of it they mean the same thing and so both the problems are structurally similar. Now, another interesting thing to look at is in terms of how do experts solve problems. So, experts have something which are called expertise which are exceptional knowledge uh, performances in a certain specific problem domain area. So, now from the 1950s experts are now viewed as a product expertise is basically seen as a product of innate capabilities, but nowadays uh, in, in today's view expertise is seen as more of a skill memorizers. So, according to Erickson and Paulson's 1988 skilled memory 
theory, there are several differences between how an expert or how a novice solves a problem. First, experts have highly rich semantic networks, which basically means that the semantic network, the thinking network, the network through which they solve problems are highly developed or highly connected with each other. Experts have quicker and more direct access to long term memory. So, most experts can easily uh, access long term memory, uh, because they have done this problem solving this kind of a problem uh, over and over again. And so, they have quick access to long term memory, then in terms of what a novice could do. And information is more easily encoded onto long term memory by experts. And the speed speed of the encoding improves with practice. Now, if for an expert he can understand quickly the problem, the, the parts of the problem quickly represent the problem in the correct format and quickly find out the problem space also find out the correct operators and can solve it. For novices the problem is the problem arises the hindrance arises right from the very beginning where the representation of the problem has acts as a hindrance and even if the representation is there they might not find the correct operators. And so, this is the difference between an expert and a uh, novice problem solving. Now, what are the advantages of an expert problem solver? The core of the problem solving is memory, the long term memory that allows for storage of domain knowledge or general information of specific episodes that working memory that allows for quick and efficient online processing of uh, the information. So, basically studies by Chase and Simon 1973 and De Groot 1988, they point that experts can instantly recognize problem configurations based on extensive knowledge and experiences. So, uh, what the experts tend to do is they quickly rep uh, understand a problem, when they look at a problem they are very easy in understanding or they are very quick in identifying the problem configuration, which means that problem representations is very easy in expert, they can very quickly identify a problem. Now, Erickson and Creech in 1995, they proposed that the idea of long term working memory to explain expert advantage in, in online uh, processing of problems. Now, the theory states that experts can bypass limits of the working memory by using the information or the working memory to direct access to LTM. So, what experts can do is they can bypass this working memory uh, uh, storage capacity problem and they can using the working memory directly access the long term memory and so this is the way how experts are better. Also expert problem solvers use gender strategies that differ from those of the novice. They leads to searching the problem space in a forward fashion then uh, reaching from uh, the goal. So, what experts tend to do is they when given a problem they do not think about the goal state and, and travel back from the goal state to the problem state. What experts tend to do is they use novel strategies, they use effective strategies and they always move in a forward direction from the initial state to the goal state and that is why they are faster in solving a problem than um, coming from the goal state to the problem state. Experts are much better picking up on structural features of the problem and recognizing analogous problem. So, experts are not fooled by the surface feature of a problem, they always look at the meaning, they always look at the at the conceptual level how a problem is different from some other problem and so they are easy, they are easy in understanding the structure these structural problems and identifying analogous solutions to it. And uh, Lemar and Sigler in 1995 proposed that the adaptive strategy model which distinguishes between experts and novice. And what does he say? The strategy existence experts have more number of strategies in disposal. Since they have solved problems in so many uh, ways or they have solved so many problems, they have something called the novel strategies or more number of strategies at the disposal than the novice. Also strategies based, based rate experts in a given uh, domain of knowledge. Uh, which strategies tend to work and select those strategies. So, in a given domain of knowledge for example, like you can math expert, they tend to know which formulas are going to work, which formulas are not going to work. And so, they tend to be very choicey in using those strategies or using those formulas which are going to work and not uh, those formulas which are not going to work. So, they do not do foolish acts, what they tend to do is only those uh, strategies are used by experts which tend to work and they oh, use those strategies over and over again. And the third thing is strategy choice refers to experts advantage in discerning which strategy should be chosen for a specific circumstances. So, they are very quick in identifying which strategy should be chosen over which other strategies and how the strategies choice works with in uh, circumstances work with environment. So, what is the relation between environment and strategy and they are very quick in identifying which strategy is going to work and which strategy is not going to work or which strategy to choose and which strategy to not choose. 
and fourth is strategy execution refers to that expert advantage in actually carrying out the strategy in terms of speed and accuracy. So, basically even if they know a strategy novice would not be able to basically implement the strategy with speed uh, and accuracy, but experts what they tend to do is since they have used the strategy a number of times they know what strategy is going to work and they have a number of strategies at their use they also can execute the strategy fast with higher speed and higher accuracy and that is how they differ from the uh, novice. But then this is not the only thing there are certain disadvantages also for example, novice are better at understanding uh, randomly arranged problems than experts. Novice can focus on to uh, problems or elements of the problem which experts will not focus on. Since experts are always directed to solving a problem they always look at those factors in a problem which uh, require a solution or which give them a hint towards the solution. And so, they tend to overlook other features or other answers in a particular problem. Also, novice remember more information about specific problems than experts and this is termed as immediate imme intermediate effect. Now, what happens here is that novice since they look at a problem study the problem wholly they understand all parts of the problem right. What experts tend to do is pick up only those configurations which need solution or which have solution and so one once you ask both the expert as well as the novice about basic questions relating to what the problem was novice will tell you more about what the problem was and not the solution faster, but experts will not be able to tell you what the problem the overall problem was. They will only look at features of the problem and how to go ahead and solve it and experts may actually be solve actually solve problem using mental set as compared to novice users. Now, experts make this mental set of a solution of how a particular solution should arise, how a particular problem should be represented and solution should be approached at and they use mental set. Whereas, novice do not have these mental set and so they can uh, have varied solutions they come up with multiple solutions although if not correct it may not be correct, but they can come up with these things and so they are uh, different from experts. And so, in what we did in this today's lecture is we looked at uh, different type of problems uh, solutions which exist what are the pro uh, uh, hindrances to the problem solutions which are there did a comparison of various uh, problem solving techniques and at the end of it we also looked at what is the difference between or how experts and novices differ with each other in terms of solving a problem. Thank you.